this morning in bringing uh, the word of the Lord to you, I'd like to, I'd like to talk with you about the power of transformation and to understand that um, God has called us to live lives that indeed are transformed lives. Max Licato, in his book, Just Like Jesus, he tells a story about a lady who had a small house on the seashore of Ireland at the turn of the 20th century. She was quite wealthy, but also quite frugal. The people were surprised then when she decided to be among the first to have electricity in her home. Several weeks after the installation, a meter assessor appeared at her door. He asked her if her electricity was working well, and she assured him it was. I'm wondering if you can explain something to me, he said. Your meter shows scarcely any usage. Are you using your power? Certainly, she answered. Each evening when the sun sets, I turn on my lights just long enough to light my candles, and then I turn the lights off. She is tapped into the power, but doesn't use it. Her house is connected, but not altered. And so it's that line, connected, but not altered, that I would like to address today. I wonder how many in the 21st century church, how many of our churches, that that would be a sad description of some of our churches, that we are connected to the power of the Holy Spirit. But many live lives that are not altered. And so I want to be a voice of encouragement uh, to you today to, to really think about how that you can take the salvation that God has so freely given to us and to live a life that is not only connected, but that is altered. I'd like to begin this message with a rhetorical question. What distinguishes the transformation of Christ's disciples from the followers of other world religions? I'd like for you just to think about that question for a little bit, and throughout this message, uh, it'll provide an answer uh, to the question. I want to look at four individuals in the New Testament. Their stories are familiar stories, but I'd like to I'd like to just um, kind of unpack these four stories and see the common thread that these four men had, how their lives were connected to each other. And, and yet, these are, these are guys whose lives were connected to the power of the Holy Spirit, and indeed, whose lives were altered. The first person I would like to look at this morning is the life of Stephen. And if, so if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, beginning at verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Stephen boldly proclaimed the gospel message of Jesus Christ. God had empowered him to be a very skilled debater. He was such a good debater that those that were listening to him were, with, were left without argument. They had no response. The story picks up in Acts chapter 7. And in Acts chapter 7 in verse um, 54, you see the apologetics that Stephen gives for his faith in Jesus Christ. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. 
But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Throughout the scriptures, we see Jesus Christ and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And so you can, you can look at uh, multiple scriptures. I'll, I'll give you just a few that I have written down here. Luke 22, verse 69 says, But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Mark records the ascension of Jesus Christ in chapter 16, and he makes this comment in verse 19. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. And then you have in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, a very familiar verse, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 1974 to 78, I went to Bethany Bible College, which is in Santa Cruz. And as I was preparing for ministry, I remember, you know, just um, uh, we would have chapel five days a week. And one day in chapel, they brought in a musical group. I don't remember the group, but um, uh, they, they were good. And they, they sang and ministered to us. And I just remember in chapel that day that uh, one of my friends, Naomi, at the, at the conclusion on their last song, when everybody was applauding, that she stood to her feet near the front. And typically in a standing ovation, when one person stands, others around stand, and then everybody stands, and it, you know, it turns into a full uh, standing ovation. But I just remembered just that a little bit of awkwardness that I felt that day as I just watched that everybody stayed in their seat except Naomi. And I would say that a standing ovation of one is not real impressive. That isn't less that standing ovation is Jesus Christ. And here's what's happening right here is Stephen, as he becomes the first martyr of the church just before, he looks up and he says, look, he said, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. Well, I mean, what a moment of, um, of affirmation for Stephen as just before those stones were hurled in his direction, he sees Jesus Christ, whose rightful position is seated at the right hand of the Father, stand to his feet and acknowledge his sacrifice. Well, when I, when I think about Stephen being connected to the power of the Holy Spirit and living a life that was altered. Indeed, his life was altered and he altered many other lives because the scriptures go on to tell us that at that moment when those stones were hurled in his direction, that that's when great persecution broke out in the, in the, in the newfound New Testament church, which leads us to the second person I'd like to uh, mention here, and that is Saul, who becomes the great Apostle Paul. And Saul was the single greatest threat to the newly established New Testament church. He was on a personal mission from hell to destroy the works of that newfound church. In Acts chapter 7, you see Stephen fully transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he becomes the first martyr, but he becomes the first martyr with Saul's approval. 
Look what the scriptures say in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Verse 4 goes on to say, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So Stephen's death marked the beginning of persecution of the New Testament church. And here the church was in its infancy. It had just been established. You have uh, the events of the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And now we're just a few chapters away in a very short time after Acts chapter 2, in which the church is thriving, but the church is only in Jerusalem. And so by God's design, he knew that this church has to go beyond this city of Jerusalem. And so allowing the persecution against Stephen may be one of those things where you sometimes wonder, like, if there's a loving and caring God, why doesn't he intervene? Why doesn't he stop all the human suffering? There's reasons that God allows human suffering. You know, we don't have answers today. I mean, we look and see what happened in Vegas a couple weeks ago today, and we just scratch our head, you know, and just you, you, you find yourself just thinking, God, that, that so easily could have been avoided, you know, just somehow just intervene. And yet God in his sovereignty allows suffering in this present day. And he allows Stephen to be that first martyr. And in doing so, the church is scared to death of Saul. And, and they scatter. The apostles are the ones who stayed behind in Jerusalem. But re most of the rest of the church, the scripture says, they scattered. But everywhere they went, they preached the gospel. That tells me uh, something about being connected and being altered. These lives were altered by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when I look at Stephen, or I'm sorry, when I look at Saul here, um, you know, he was just on this mission to destroy the church. And so look at Acts chapter 9. It makes this statement, beginning at verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So on the road to Damascus, we see the transformation that takes place in the life of, of Saul. Saul was indeed connected to, uh, well, as the Apostle Paul was connected to the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit began to, to use him in, in powerful ministry. But what's interesting about Saul is that once he had been, you know, he had seen the risen Lord on the road and was filled with the Holy Spirit and was a powerful um, a presenter. He, he, he was very articulate. And yet when he goes back to Jerusalem, the apostles are still scared to death of Saul. They want nothing to do with him. Brings us to the third person here, and that's Barnabas. Acts chapter 9, verse 23. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. 
But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. So in Jerusalem, you have these uh, disciples or apostles of Jesus Christ that indeed are, are quite fearful of, of Saul, but it was Barnabas who led the disciples to give Saul a chance to trust him. Without Barnabas, who knows what would have happened. But in Jerusalem, Saul or the Apostle Paul needed a friend. And he found a great friend in Barnabas. Barnabas validated Saul's ministry. Barnabas, his life was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was connected and his life was altered. And because of that alteration that took place in his life, he went out on a limb and he presented Saul to the disciples. You know, I believe that it is a ministry gift to just believe the best in others. And sometimes you have to take a risk. And those risks don't always pay off. And you know, um, in, in, in doing so, I just think that there, you know, that there are times where we put ourselves uh, maybe in, in, in just a little bit of an awkward situation where, where we're just trying to see the best in someone. And even though, you know, we all have things in our past that we just wish that maybe this one chapter was different. If we could go back and rewrite the chapters of our lives, uh, I, I do. And I venture to say everybody has something. But you know, you, you have a person like Barnabas uh, here, and Barnabas, son of encouragement, he just sees the best in people. And he, when everybody looked at Saul and, and saw the murderous threats that came from this guy and were scared to death, Barnabas looked at him. And I believe there was just something about him that he was able to, to foresee something about this becoming the Apostle Paul. He believed in him. And so he presented him to the disciples. Well, Saul and Barnabas became very close friends. And in the book of Acts, in chapter 12, concludes by telling how that Saul and Barnabas were making preparation for their first missionary journey that's recorded in, in Acts 13. But look at the last verse. It says, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. This introduces the fourth person, John Mark. John Mark's a very interesting uh, young man. Back in the day, there weren't the Bible college. He's, he had no chance to go to something like a Bethany Bible college like I had the privilege of going to. But basically, uh, it was a school of hard knocks. You wanted to go into ministry or experience any kind of missions work. Uh, you just went and did it. And so here we see Saul and Barnabas taking on their first missionary trip, John Mark. Well, John Mark had a lot of ministry potential. He's a really incredible person to study. 
he came from a very wealthy home. His parents were well-to-do. There would have been servants in the home. As a matter of fact, when you go back to Acts chapter 1 and, uh, and you read about them, the disciples being gathered together in an upper room, it is believed that that was John Mark's parents' home where uh, the disciples made basically their headquarters for while they were ministering in, in Jerusalem. And so John Mark, a young man, was an eyewitness to Jesus Christ, uh, possibly even the crucifixion of Jesus. And yet um, um, with him, it's like, you know, here's just a, a young man. And in Acts 13, we see just the introduction of someone who will then write for us the gospel according to Mark. So we know kind of the rest of the story, what, uh, what happens with, with John Mark, that he indeed becomes um, very useful in the work and ministry of the kingdom. And so Barnabas, um, Barnabas is cousin to John Mark. And so it's easy for him when he kind of um, sees that hey, I took a risk with Paul, it paid off. I'll take a risk with my cousin and we'll take him and we'll see if we can grow and develop and help to nurture him into another effective minister of the gospel of Christ. And so I would say um, one of the main ideas that I would like to give in this, in this message here today is that the Holy Spirit uses each one of us to bring about transformation in the lives of other people. Now, I really would like for you to stop and just consider that for a moment, because whether it's a next door neighbor or whether you go to King Supers and it's the, it's the attendant, the clerk there that's checking you out at the check stand and getting your groceries all bagged up and so forth. And you see this person day, you know, maybe not day in a day out, but I mean, probably weekly, uh, you know, do you ever just try to make a casual relationship? Do you try to find someone's name and you're going to see them again and then just to call them by name? And then eventually, you know, you, you, you come to a place where there's always opportunities. Um, and sometimes we just have to be creative and find those opportunities or create opportunities to share Jesus Christ. But the transformation that is taking place in other people, sometimes it's like the Holy Spirit is saying, you know, cue you. This is your role right here. That if you'll step up right now into this, in, into this role, this person is prime. And so it is with, uh, with, with John Mark. And Barnabas was uh, taking a risk on his cousin. But then we see in Acts chapter 13... In verse 13, it says, From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, at first read, you know, where it just simply says, And John left them, this doesn't appear to be that big a deal. But as you read later in the book of Acts, it was a very big deal to the Apostle Paul. Boy, I tell you, the Apostle Paul, um, you know, this was a carefully planned missions trip. And they plotted out where they were going to go, what they were going to do, how long they would stay at places. But yet uh, they knew that some circumstances would, would alter their, their time frame. So it wasn't like they were on a given clock or calendar uh, keeping appointments or anything. But they, he was going to these communities. And... You talk about church planting, I mean, the Apostle Paul is planting churches everywhere he goes. And as he's planting churches, uh, you know, the three of them are together. And so there you have Saul and Barnabas and John Mark. And they're working, uh, working together effectively. But the risk doesn't always pay off. Sometimes, and that's why it's risk. You know, sometimes you take a risk and that risk doesn't work. Look at Acts chapter 15 and verse 36. It says, Sometime later, 
Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. So now, you know, some time has elapsed and Paul and, Sil uh, Paul, uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas are now thinking about their second missionary journey. But look what happens because um, this is where the, um, a problem arises and it ends up being a pretty significant problem. Um, chapter 15, verse 37. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. So here we understand that Paul looked at where earlier it just simply said where Mark left them, where Paul looks at this and says, no, he deserted us. We don't know, the scripture doesn't tell us what, what happened, um, whether or not John Mark had only thought in his mind that he would go thus far and then head home. Maybe. Maybe he simply got homesick. Uh, his home, there would have been servants and there, there would have been people, you know, taking care of uh, many needs that he had. And maybe, you know, on this missions journey, maybe he just simply uh, grew homesick. Scriptures don't really tell us about it, but it's one of those things now where this potentially is going to be a wedge between the relationship of Paul and Barnabas. Look at chapter 15, verse 39. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. How is it that two men empowered by the Holy Spirit whose lives are transformed, they are connected, their lives are altered, and yet they have a disagreement. And it's not just a casual disagreement. Scripture says right here they had such a sharp disagreement, or the message puts it this way. It says, tempers, flare, tempers flared, and they end up going their separate ways. They both had tempers. And their tempers got in the way here. And so now you've got two men that are empowered with the Holy Spirit. And they're fighting with each other. They're arguing. And it's over John Mark of whether or not John Mark should be able to come on this second missionary trip. You know, I, I, I find this point just absolutely fascinating because as believers I look around in the body of Christ and you know I don't always see eye to eye with everyone who calls himself a believer and people don't always see eye to eye with me I wish they would um, but, <laughs> but you know what uh, I, I, I look at this and then you, you look at families within the body of Christ and how many families are, would be represented here that, that there is an estranged relationship? And you say, yeah, but you know, I, I'm, I'm a godly person. I, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm okay with my father. It's, it's good between us. I'm just not good with so-and-so. And fill in the blank. How can that be? How can two men so in love with Jesus, be so at odds with one another that they part company and they go different directions. Well, when I look at this, it's like, well, you know what? Sometimes, and I'm very careful on making this statement because um, we're just not into seeing churches split. Sometimes separation is, 
is for the greater good. And what we, what's hard to see right here when you're just reading this passage of Scripture is that what, what's, what the Spirit is doing behind the scenes is he's preparing now to send out two missionary teams instead of one. The church is growing exponentially, and it's growing at a rate that's faster than what this three-man missions team can accomplish. And so there's a little bit of strife and tension, and God uses it for his good to allow two teams to go out, and now you've got two missionary teams that are effectively, I mean, you read the scriptures, they both, both mission teams experience ministry success. We see good things happening on both missionary journeys. So it's not just like, you know, we would naturally think, come on, guys, get along and all stay together and go do your work and work together. But somehow in the midst of strife, of division, of sharp disagreement, God is still able to do his work. And so I would just say to you that if you've got a, a family member that you're estranged with, you know, I, yes, I, I, I think how the scripture says, you know, live at peace with all men as far as it depends with, with you. And so I would say to find a way to, to forgive one another. You can't stay at odds with one another and call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a, that's, a, that's a bold statement to make, and I recognize that. And so I look at these two men, and we'll, we'll see the rest of the story here in a second here, but I, 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 I want to just talk with you for a moment about just this aspect of forgiving one another. We, we, we've all done things in which, you know, you want someone to forgive you, and yet others have done things to you in which you just say, but you have no idea. You have no idea how deep the hurt is. You know, and I, 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 I just think that, you know, sometimes fathers have done the unspeakable to their own children. And to think about how do you forgive a father that has abused you? How do you forgive that? And God so wants us to move on. He so wants us to be people that are just free to forgive those who have hurt us. The scriptures tell us this way. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, it says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Okay, so the scripture says right there, if your brother or your sister has something against you. In other words, you're the offender. You've, you've offended them. It may, it may not have been intentional, uh, but you've hurt them, and you're the offender. But there at the altar, you remember that your, your, your brother's been hurt by you. Well, Scripture says right there that that is your responsibility to go make that right. But then you turn over to Mark chapter 11, verse 25, and it says, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive your transgressions. I don't know what is... Um, it, that sounds really bad, but that's my microphone. <laughs> that's my... <laughs> Wow, timing on that. I totally lost my train of thought on that one. 
Let me read this again. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. So that passage of Scripture says, if you have anything against anyone, in other words, you're the one who's offended. So whether you're the offender or whether you're the offended, the Scripture says it's your responsibility to make that right, to forgive that person. It doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on. It's your responsibility. And so with Paul and Barnabas, you know, they, they were transformed, and the Bible doesn't tell us how did these men um, reconcile their differences with one another. But we know just by reading Scripture that, that they did recognize. When I think about the Apostle Paul and the many people that uh, he had in his life, in his life, and how many people he had the privilege of leading to Jesus. And you just think of all of the great people in, in all of the books of, uh, uh, that, you know, that are uh, recorded in, in Scripture from the Apostle Paul. And his very last writing. Remember, Paul's, Paul's writings are not given to us chronologically. Um, they are given to us in order of, of length. And so from the longest 1 Corinthians uh, to, to the shortest, we're, we're given Paul's books in, in order of their length. So 2 Timothy is not the shortest, but it is believed that 2 Timothy is the last words penned by the Apostle Paul. Chapter 4, the last chapter, verse 11, it says... Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. So we know that the thing that caused the great dissension between John Mark, or between um, uh, Paul and Barnabas, was John Mark. And we see right here at the very end that the apostle says, Get John Mark and bring him because he's helpful to me in ministry. In other words, we know that everything that had created that dissension was made right. So I come back and I'll uh, conclude this message with the question that I posed to start this message, and that is basically how are the transformations of these four disciples how are they any different than the transformations that take place from anybody else whose life has been altered, transformed because of the world religion they believe in? What makes ours right? You know, it's a, it, it's a question I believe that believers should be prepared to be able to give an answer, an answer for. Because transformation, it's really interesting because transformation does not prove anyone to be right. Transformation only proves that the person whose life is transformed believe the teachings to be true. But could it be that they're believing a lie? So what makes our transformation different than anyone else's, any other world religion. Friends, it all comes back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the resurrection of Jesus that changes everything. And that is why these four gentlemen that we've discussed here, their lives were influenced by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you take the resurrection away from us, you've stripped us of the most fundamental of our beliefs. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if you, 
if you take this piece away from us, Paul says, then I am of all men most miserable. That if Christ was not raised, then neither will we be raised. He goes on to say, but Christ has been raised. The first fruit of those who have been resurrected from the dead. And therefore, because Christ overcame the grave, then we too, that's what, that's what helps us take being connected to being altered, is you believe this aspect that God raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 10, 9, you know, if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. If we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, the scripture says you shall be saved. It all rests on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I'd like to pray with, uh, pray with you here this, this morning and uh, challenge you that if your life is connected to Jesus Christ, but yet maybe just not really showing a life that's, that's really altered, maybe you could just give more thought to this aspect of what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means to you. Would you bow your heads with me, please?